Eat clean to get lean, right? That seems like a good t-shirt slogan, so it must be a valid dietary philosophy we can take to the bank as well, right? Well, sure, but it's not the whole story. How much does the quality of your food matter in your diet when it comes to leaning out, building muscle, and just being healthy in general? I'm Darren Starr, and we're going to hash out the details in episode 263 of The Drop Set right now. Let's hit it. What's up everybody, Darren Star here. Thanks for joining me. Today, episode 263 of The Drop Set, we are going to talk about food quality. How much does food quality matter? Before we kick it off real quick, um, thank you to all existing listeners out there in podcast land. If you're watching on YouTube, thank you as well. Hit the uh, like button, subscribe to the video, all that good stuff. You can check out what I do at fivestarphysique.com for coaching workout programs or fivestardigital.com for my online courses such as Hypertrophy University, Macro Boot Camp, Bikini Blueprint, and more coming soon. Um, you can check me out on Instagram at Darren underscore star or the show specifically at The Drop Set Podcast. So with all that out of the way, let's dive in here. Does food quality really matter? Well, as the saying goes, it depends, of course. The conversation often comes down to one of good foods versus bad foods. And I gotta tell you, like with every fiber of my being, I hate this conversation so much. I really, it's old, it's tired, I feel like it's been worn out to death, and anybody who has an opinion on this is probably not going to be convinced by me or anybody else. So, disclaimer, full stop, you do you. If uh, you believe that food quality has zero impact on anything, hey, that's great. If you think that if you don't eat clean, whole foods, then you will die at the age of 20, then that's great. Like, believe what you wanna believe. I'm here to offer my opinion based on a lot of time spent coaching a lot of people, doing a lot of reading, conducting a lot of research. So, um, a lot of what I hear from people, and this would be things like, um, just people out and about, like in conversations that I have. If you've been listening to this show for any length of time, you know I'm not a big extrovert. I'm not going out. I'm not a man on the street looking to just talk to people and shove a microphone in people's face. Occasionally, I do come into contact with human beings and I have to have what's known as a conversation with them, um, which is always uncomfortable. It's always kind of makes me sweat uncontrollably. Um, but invariably it comes to like, hey, what do you do? Oh, I'm a bodybuilding coach. Really? Oh, you like tell people how to work out and stuff? And like, yeah, pretty much. That's, that's more or less it. I'm like you do their diet and stuff too? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, oh, yeah, okay. What do you, what do you think about this food, that food, this diet, that diet? And I eat pretty clean. I eat pretty healthy as they're standing there with like a plate full of like sausages in their hand or whatever. Um, so the, the phrases that I hear often from people in those situations or just um, potential clients reaching out to me looking for a coach um, would be things like, these are the, the warning phrases that I was looking out for. I eat clean. I watch what I eat. I eat mostly healthy. And the one universal truth among all those people is that they aren't hitting their physique goals. <laughs> like, clearly, like there's something to the, the notion of eating clean, but for what we're trying to do as far as change body composition, that ain't enough. That ain't getting the job done. Like That alone can do certain things for you, but just eating clean, et cetera, it's just... It, there, and there are people, there are like influencers on social media who will tout this as well. And it's just a gross oversimplification of the process. If anybody says like, just eat clean, healthy foods, you know, and just, you know, eat what you grow, blah, 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 blah. And then you can look like I do. This is somebody who has great genetics or they're lying to you and they're doing a lot more than that. So what it comes down to is, is really, you know, precision on things more than anything else. Um, so first and foremost, like this is primarily a numbers game when we're talking about body composition. A lot of people say that I don't like to count calories. I don't want to count macros or anything like that. Like great, but somebody has to, 
whether you're doing that yourself or you're following a plan set by somebody else, that person has counted macros for you. So the macros, the calories are getting counted. Um, if you just like, well, I, I eat this portion of this and it looks about like this on the plate, blah, blah, blah. You're counting calories still, it's just you're doing it visually instead of through math. So it, it's the portion size, it's the calorie total and the macronutrient distribution among those calories that really matters. Um, but not entirely. There is a little bit more to it than that. There is a little bit of nuance here. If it was if it was that simple, I would love to keep this episode at just four minutes long and send you on your way and say, there you go, that's it. It's just numbers, pure and simple, that's it. That's all there is to it. Don't worry about the rest and go live your lives, be happy. Um, unfortunately, it's not quite that simple. And to be totally honest about it, we gotta dig in a little bit deeper. So portions and macros, they are the top tier concern when it comes to body composition change, fat loss, muscle gain, etc. But top tier means that they aren't the only game in town. There are other things that we have to consider here as well. So it's, it's good to have a discussion about what does good and bad even mean in terms of foods. And again, we start getting into some of these keywords and these buzzwords, things that kind of drive me nuts and kind of get my hackles up a little bit. Um, the most common words here would be something processed. It has chemicals. Um, artificial sweeteners, added sugars, those are all bad things, or just something that lacks those would be considered a good thing. Um, the thing is though, like all foods are processed to some degree. I've made the argument before that picking an apple off of a tree is processing it. So where do you draw the line on that? Well, as soon as it goes in a package, that's when it becomes processed. Okay, so if you take a uh, cucumber and you wrap it in plastic, is that processing it? Like, you know, well, no, it has to be in a bag. And it's like, where does the line get drawn here? Like we can all agree that an Oreo is processed, whereas a leaf of lettuce is probably not. Um, but there's a mountain of gray area in between there. So that's a distinction that frankly, I simply don't give a shit about. Like, I, I don't worry about that. Chemicals, everything in the, in the known universe is made up of chemicals. Which ones are you concerned about? Can you name them? Do you know why you're concerned about them? Let's just, again, take that as a concern that we're just not going not gonna to worry about. So if we're not chemists, we don't need to be worried about chemicals specifically. There can be certain compounds that you might want to stay away from. We've talked before about artificial sweeteners and their ability or inability to cause cancer. We've talked about that a handful of episodes ago, so I feel like we've covered that. Don't need to revisit that here. Um, added sugars are something that will appear on the nutrition label, and I think this can be a little bit more insightful. Um, this goes into a certain type of processing that goes into a food designed to make it taste better than it otherwise would <laughs> because sugar is tasty, and we like that. And so this is... Um, nutritionally deficient stuff. These are nutritionally deficient calories that we're pumping into a food specifically just to make it taste better. And specifically it, what it's going to do in the body is cause a blood sugar spike, which is going to cause an insulin re release. And that, enough of that over time can be very problematic. So the added sugar thing, yeah, that, that I would watch and be concerned about. So let's talk about some good foods first. Um, Typically, I think when people talk about good foods, clean foods, we're talking about things that are single ingredient foods. So if you look at a package of something that's you know processed, um, there's going to be a whole slew of ingredients. If you pick up an avocado, it doesn't have an ingredient list because it's just a fucking avocado. That's all it is. I think we all know what a single ingredient food is. I don't think we need to belabor the point any further on that. Um, a lot of these foods, amazingly healthy, um, really good. So they have a really good micronutrient profile. Um, they have a wide variety of micronutrients as well. A lot of them have great macronutrients. A lot of them have very poor macronutrients for what we're looking for as far as physique outcomes. Um, and a lot of these foods, bring very little to the table as well. So just because something is single ingredient doesn't necessarily mean that it is great. Um, it's not bad, but is it useful? Does it bring any utility for us as bodybuilders, as people who are concerned with aesthetics? Um, first and foremost, and concerned with health, I would say, as a secondary thing, understanding that most of what we do is kind of geared towards health anyway. So I think it's okay for a lot of people to allow the health aspect of their diet to kind of take a back seat because by virtue of focusing on your body composition, there's a certain amount of, you know, net health that's just going to come into your diet and your lifestyle is kind of healthy in general anyway. So um, for people who don't really focus too much on a healthy diet, but one that changes their physique in the way that they're looking for, 
I think that's fine. Um, just because they're doing enough good stuff for their health anyway. If not everything that they do in their life is geared exclusively towards the idea of being as healthy as possible, you're still doing better than most people. So I think that's a fair trade-off to make. Um, so think about this. Um, so <laughs> one thing on the slide here, it says a lot of these foods just don't bring a lot in terms of nutrient density. You've got um, with a lot of these foods, there are certain effects or certain uh, micronutrient profiles or specific micronutrients that they are touted to have in excess or be in high amounts of. And one of them that keeps coming back in is um, spinach. Uh, and spinach is high in iron specifically. Huh, okay, well that's great. Uh, but per 100 grams, Oreo cookies have more iron than spinach. And to add insult to injury, um, there have been studies that show that the iron in spinach specifically is absorbed in the small intestine as, in, at rates as low as 2%, which means that the iron in spinach is basically worthless. So you can look at the numbers and say like, wow, it has a lot of iron. Yeah, but your body doesn't really use any of it at all. It might as well have zero, and it's getting trounced by an Oreo cookie in terms of iron. I think three Oreos contain eight grams of iron, something like that, which is very high for a, a food like that that you would not expect to bring anything of value to the table. But there you go. Does it bring much else to the table? No, it doesn't. But iron, if you're, if you're looking for that, there you go. Oreos are, are the way to go. Um, spinach, not so much. So no single food is essential. Um, and honestly, no food group is essential. People say, eat your fruits, eat your veggies. You can eat no fruit and be very healthy. You cannot eat veggies and be quite healthy. You can skip grains entirely. You can skip dairy. You can skip legumes. You can not eat any starches. You can not eat, not eat any animal proteins and be perfectly healthy. Like any single group, entire group of foods, you can completely pull out and probably be just fine. Now, you can't pull it out and then just be willy-nilly about the things that you might be missing by pulling out that group. In doing that, so you're, you're lessening your dietary variety, and so the chance that you would then become deficient in a micronutrient somewhere, vitamin, mineral, etc., becomes higher. So a lot of these groups are um, known to be more rich, more diverse in the micronutrients that they bring into the fold. And so if you eliminate an entire group, yeah, you can be totally fine, but hmm, watch this just to make sure. So the one thing that I would um, say is probably the biggest red flag among, among identifying shysters um, would be anybody who says you must eat this food. And so I'm talking about people like Dr. Oz and just fucking idiots like him. Um, if you eat, if you find anybody who says you've got to eat this, this is the secret ingredient, this is the key to whatever, it's like just punch that person in the face and run away. They are worthless. They don't know what they're talking about. They're specifically just trying to sell something or get clicks, clickbait, whatever. So that's it. They don't have anything useful to offer you. I can promise you that. There are no magic foods. If there were, everybody would fucking know about it already and nobody would have the secret. It's just ridiculous. So it is never true, as the slide says. Um, no single food is required. Um, every food group in a vacuum can be omitted as well um, and, and not really have any negative impacts for a lot of people. So if you eliminate veggies, for example, um, you're missing out on some good sources of dietary fiber, but there are other foods that are good sources of dietary fiber as well. And a lot of people do just fine. I'm thinking about people who follow a carnivore diet with zero fiber um, at all. Um, everybody's GI is different. So everybody's going to have a slightly different individual response to this as well. So what I'm telling you are just the absolutes and the absolutes are not everybody needs everything. So you can experiment with removing things on your own if you want to. I would say there's not really a lot of value for people to remove food groups willy nilly other than to say, I removed this for a month and I was fine or whatever. If you want to do that, go for it. I don't think there's much point in doing that. But if you are somebody who has some kind of an autoimmune disorder and has a really, really sensitive GI, for example, um, then yeah, I mean, eliminating some entire food groups and really limiting your dietary profile can be the only thing that really keeps you out of bed all day long and keeps you moving and provides you with energy and keeps your GI functioning in a good way. Um, now again, that is not most people. 
So most people <laughs> do just fine with a lot of variety. And I think having a lot of variety in your diet is a good thing. It is not essential, but it's a good thing. So what does matter for us? Again, in terms of physique outcomes, body composition changes that we're looking for, and being somewhat healthy. Well, hitting your macronutrient targets. That, um, first of all, there, there's nothing that's going to impact your health more negatively than being overweight. And so if we're just trying to drop body fat, hitting your macronutrient targets, regardless of how you do it, is number one. That's priority number one. Um, micronutrient diversity, just to make sure that we're hitting everything. So getting in a good array of B vitamins, of electrolytes, um, you know, calcium, magnesium, sodium, potassium, um, all of these things, all your vitamins, all your minerals, zinc, iron, as mentioned before, all of these, you want to make sure that you're getting good amounts so that you're not deficient in anything. And a variety of foods makes it easier to do that. But let's be clear, nobody is a walking encyclopedia of what foods are rich or poor in certain things. And also, as mentioned before in spinach, you can, you know, have follow, uh, track all your foods, log your spinach, great. And your macro tracking app shows that you've hit your iron target for the day, awesome, but you haven't because it's just not absorbed by your system. So that's another level of complexity on there. So now you might be just throwing your hands up in the air and saying, Darren, what the fuck do I do? Oh my God, I just, I don't, it's too much. And it is too much. And honestly, I would say by and large, don't worry about this stuff, which I could have led with that, right? <laughs> <laughs> Again, would have made for a shorter episode. And those short episodes, we're not learning a whole lot. So um, your, the micronutrient content from your food sources, um, as opposed to supplementation, you know, that is inconclusive. There have been some studies that say like, oh, don't take a multivitamin because, you know, the absorption is lower. Like, well, as we've noticed before, you know, in the spinach example and others, your absorption from food sources isn't necessarily great either. So there, your body just, it's, it's not necessarily super efficient at taking in things that it needs. Um, calcium is one that your body is very picky on the sources that it will properly absorb calcium from. Um, and so uh, what we wanna do is really just avoid a micronutrient de deficient, deficiency. And blood work is how we know that. Blood work is how we know if we're deficient on anything, if we're getting things in in excess and are becoming toxic on certain things. Typically, your, your toxicity is going to be on things like your fat-soluble vitamins, your A, D, E, and K. D being the one that is most commonly toxic on just because people tend to supplement a little aggressively on vitamin D. Um, and so watching those would be the thing that I would be concerned with. What do your labs show? And if you're following your diet and you're not really worrying about this stuff too much, and your labs come back and they show that you're fine, hey, guess what? Continue not worrying about it. That's fine, that's the take home point here. So micronutrients from supplementation versus food. So there's no harm in taking a multivitamin to cover the bases. Let's just dispel that myth right away. Um, there is uh, some evidence that shows that calcium via supplementation can pose a slightly increased risk of a heart attack, but that was one study, it was inconclusive. So. Um, that's the kind of thing that would like, <laughs> when that study comes out, would lead your local news and say like, you know, new research shows that taking a multivitamin increases your risk of heart attack. More at 11. It's like, yeah, it's a teaser and it's, it's one study, it's inconclusive, it gets people to watch your fucking news program, but it's not worth, it's not worthwhile information that's anything that you can base a decision on or have any, uh, any kind of confidence on as far as informing the decision or anything like that. And there's, there's some uh, evidence that shows that there's lower absorption of um, micronutrients from multivitamins. And there's some that shows that there's evidence for higher absorption from micronutrients. So as it says, just great. Like there's no answer here at all. So what we can say definitively that there's that there is no conclusive evidence that taking a multivitamin hurts you and realistically it can only help you. Even if the absorption is lower from a multivitamin than it would be from a food source, it's still not zero and so therefore it's your safety net. Like if your food variety is such that you don't want to met, if you don't you don't want to track a spreadsheet and go into research mode and say, okay, so here's what I, here are my iron targets for the day. Here are my niacin targets for the day. Here are my folate targets for the day. I need to hit all this stuff. And then on the other tab of this spreadsheet, I have a list of all the foods that contain those and the absorption rates of all of those. 
and like you're looking like Charlie Day at the whiteboard trying to game all this crap out. It's like, oh my God, it's like, you just don't need to do that. What do your labs show? Take a multivitamin, stop worrying about it. Get lab work done annually, take your multivitamin every day, move on with your life. So what if we follow the extremes here? Um, so let's, let's take the extreme that for me sounds like heaven. We're gonna eat a bunch of shit that has absolutely no nutrient value at all, except for our Oreos and their iron, don't forget those. And then we're gonna take a multivitamin to cover all the bases. So we're just gonna eat garbage that has no nutritional content at all, and then just get everything from our multivitamin. This should technically work. Might have other issues. You might find that your cholesterol gets skewed from low, low quality foods. So that's another thing. It's not necessarily all about the micronutrients that you take in, but it's how that stuff can impact your blood work in other ways as well. Um, so a bunch of shit foods are typically gonna be higher in high fructose corn syrup. Um, and uh, high fructose corn syrup is a little bit more preferential in partitionings towards body fat storage. Um, Fructose is fine. Fruit, et cetera, the sugars that come from fruit. It's just high fructose corn syrup just because of how concentrated it is, how much of it is, is stored in these foods that use it. So usually a diet like this is higher in sugar as well, just like eating shit foods all the time, which can lead to a loss of insulin sensitivity and can lead towards insulin resistance over time. So, And also, just like you eat enough of this crap, it's higher in sugar, you can just feel like shit. I can just wear you down. So your stomach can be impacted by this. And if you're trying to perform in the gym and perform at a high level on a daily basis, bad idea. Uh, it's just, it's not a good strategy. So it can technically work, but it's hardly what I would consider to be optimal. So let's swing the fence and go the other way here. Um, all whole foods, no exception, that's it. Single ingredient foods, we're gonna make stuff fresh all the time, that's it. Um, it's more expensive. It's more work, it's more meal prep, more frequent trips to the store just because everything's fresh. And for most people, it's gonna suck and be shitty and just not very enjoyable, right? This is where it comes back to like, how good of a cook are you? If you're not a very good cook, a plan like this sucks. <laughs> I'm sorry, this is gonna be a bullshit plan. It's not gonna, not gonna go well for you. You're gonna have a bad time. Now, if you can do that and you don't miss the garbage foods, you're probably gonna feel great and you'll be happy. And if you're a good cook and can make stuff from single ingredient foods um, and make stuff that's enjoyable and palatable, that is awesome and more power to you. I don't want it to seem like I'm coming across as being judgmental of whole food dieters or anything like that, far from it. I could not be one myself. Like I like my, my crap food. As I've said on this show many times, I'm a connoisseur of low quality foods, period, full stop. I love it. It's just so good. I'm just staring off into space right now thinking about Chips Ahoy cookies. Reduced fat wheat thins, Entenmann chocolate donuts. My wife got some chicken and a biscuit crackers a couple weeks back. Never had those before. Tried a couple. God. Like, why are those good? Like, it's just a salty cracker. It shouldn't be any good. Just a bag of chocolate chips. Just like, eat a bunch of chocolate chips. You know you can put chocolate syrup on anything and it makes it better? So basically, I work out so that I'm not 350 pounds. That's the moral of the story here. Um, so an all whole food diet <laughs> is going to get you a good built-in variety of macronutrients, probably. Now, if you eat the same stuff all the time, like a standard bodybuilding dieter would, um, you're gonna probably develop the same holes in your micronutrient profile than somebody who eats a lower quality diet overall. So. If you rely on the same two veggies all the time, the same single fruit, the same starch, the same grain, um, you're certainly going to have some holes appear in your coverage of these micronutrients. So you're still gonna want that safety net of a multivitamin behind you to catch that stuff. The, the hidden downside, so, and, and that's what I was talking about here, it's, uh, you know, you're still gonna have some of those gaps. So the, the only solution there is to eat a wide variety of whole foods, of single ingredient foods. That's just an absolute epic pain in the ass to do that shopping, that prepping, that cooking. It's like, and the planning for it as well. Again, like you're gonna have to be a Charlie Day at the whiteboard to make sense of this crap and try to make anything that even resembles a fully um, complete micronutrient happy diet. So it's not, not really worth it. Like it says here, how much work do you want to put in 
to make sure that your vitamin D3, your folate, your niacin, and your iodine levels are all up to snuff. Like, I think most of us on planet Earth in the year 2024 have better things to worry about than that. So the middle of the road approach, nothing is essential, nothing has to be avoided. Hit your macros. Get in a variety of foods in a sustainable way. So again, not something that's different every day, but have some options like meal one, oh, it could be this or this, and they're different foods. So, um, you know, like cream of rice, high in iron, oats, it's gonna be higher in fiber, other things. So, you know, you work in both of those and you kind of alternate them. You go back and forth, you have one of those four days a week, one of them three days a week. You throw in a third option, you just do like ABC, ABC, whatever, something like that. You can create meal options like that where um, you're hitting the same macros, more or less, for each meal, but the foods change, and so your micronutrient variety changes along with it. You can use some wild cards, like uh, the way that I write a um, diet. Um, if somebody's supposed to have a veggie with a meal, I just write one cup of veggies, and then there's a list of what goes along with that. Get a variety, and you know, get, you use a veggie for a week, and then you're like, I'm sick of that, I'm gonna try something else, swap it out for something else. Great, awesome. Same thing with fruit. If I write in fruit, it's gonna be like 50 calories fruit, 100 calories fruit. Get in a variety there. Frozen, fresh, doesn't matter, all good there. Um, allow for some crap, situationally. Track it, have it planned, but use it. That's fine. Again, we don't need to demonize this stuff. Um, and then take a multivitamin to cover the gaps. If you do that, you're going to be fine. You're going to create a plan that is more sustainable for you, something that's more successful, and something that can be healthy, even if it's not completely full of super high quality, high nutrient dense foods. So um, that's it, that's 263. So I did want to take a, a quick time out here at the end just to um, thank a couple of people. First of all, um, Krista, I got an email from Krista who um, just wanted to uh, pass along her enjoyment of the podcast, who's not a bodybuilder. And, uh, but she, what did she say here? She said, oh, don't have my glasses on. Let's bring it in here. There we go. She's a trail runner. So no hard feelings, Krista. Like I'm judging you a little bit, but um, it's okay. <laughs> it's okay. Um, and so I, I appreciate her comments as well. And there were a couple of reviews that came in that I saw on iTunes as well, or whatever it's called, Apple Podcasts, whatever you want to call it. I don't know. Um, from Ray BK35, um, who was commenting on the Food and Macro Trackers app. Appreciate that. And then Ray B89, who had some nice words to say as well. So appreciate you guys um, chiming in there. Certainly, um, leave continue to leave reviews apple um apple podcasts itunes will let you leave reviews um every other platform i think just allows you to pretty much leave a star rating but whatever you can um leave based on the platform that you listen to please do i'd greatly appreciate that if you do have additional comments for me you can certainly go to the dropset.com click on contact and hit me up through there that's all i got folks darren star signing off five star physique.com five star digital.com uh what was I going to say? Instagram. <laughs> there we go. At the drop set podcast for the show. Send messages there. You can send voice notes. You can send video notes and I can, um, with questions and I can comment on those here. You can uh, follow me at Darren underscore star for all my personal stuff as well. Thanks for listening and or watching. Appreciate it. Peace out. Catch you next time.